Welcome. Thanks for being here. Another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Thrilled to have Julia Patrick back. And of course, our guest, Andrew Olson, CFRE and president of Altus Marketing. Andrew's here to talk to us about understanding nonprofit leadership. It's a big conversation, <laughs> short amount of time. So stay with us and, and tune in. Um, Quickly. So, Julia Patrick, I mentioned, welcome back. Thrilled to have you here uh, co hosting today. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. She enjoyed some much needed time away, and I'm glad to, to be here with you again. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, and we are honored each and every day to have the ongoing support of our presenting sponsors. Uh, this week is our 600th episode week. So, we've been, you know, blowing this up by way of conversation, bragging about it, but this is the week it is here. Um, in fact, today is 599. So tomorrow is our 600th. But thank you so very much to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy with the National University, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. Please check these companies out because they are here to lean into you and your mission and your community. And uh, they've got so many wonderful things to offer you and your mission. So please do give them um, a browse. And if you've missed any of our episodes or you want to listen to what Andrew's sharing with us today a little bit more, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And if you're a podcast listener like I am, and I know our guest is because he actually host a podcast, you can queue up the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. So mentioning uh, Andrew and his podcast, you can find that it's the Rainmaker fundraising podcast, but I want to welcome you here. So welcome, Andrew. So glad to have you with us today. Thank you Thanks for having me. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, if it's episode 599, you're approaching 600, I, I probably need to get a tattoo 599 after this, after the Did show, you? right? Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. Would you please do that? It, it's more likely you're going to see a goat next time than a tattoo, just being honest. Right. Now that I can get behind. Yes. Andrew was sharing uh, with us that he lived on how many acres is your farm? Just under 40. Yeah. 40 acres, and you have sheep, ducks, you have a cow? Chickens, cows, goats, guineas, pigs. Oh, McDonald. Three I mean, feral children. You are, you are old McDonald. I love it. And, uh, and so you're coming to us from Tennessee today, but you've worked with so many organizations. And um, again, tell us a little bit about Altus Marketing, who you are, what you offer our sector. Sure. Yeah, Altus Marketing is a direct response fundraising agency. We serve all sorts of different nonprofits and ministry organizations. We're part of MORE, which is the largest service provider to, uh, to nonprofit organizations in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, everything from data and analytics to direct response television, direct mail, digital marketing, really anything where we need to marry a message with a marketing channel to deliver it to an individual um, is the kind of stuff that we provide. Fantastic. Wow. I love it. Well, and then you have also produced a book, which I have total, and Jared, I know Jared does too. We have total empathy and appreciation for anybody that cranks out a tome. And so 101 biggest mistakes nonprofits make and how you can avoid them. Talk to us a little bit about your book. Yeah, so uh, I wrote this a couple of years back and I actually brought about 25 other experts from across the sector to contribute to this. Uh, and the genesis of it was I, I sat in about 80 meetings with nonprofit leaders and started to see a, threads in those conversations and I said to myself, well, wait a minute, we're all making the same mistakes. Like, why are we not learning from one another? It's okay to make mistakes. Let's go make as many as possible and learn and, and get better. But why do we keep making the same mistakes? Uh, and I couldn't find anything in the market that addressed those. So I grabbed a couple of friends and said, let's create it. Nice. Much needed. And so you had shared with us that we can find this on LinkedIn as well as Amazon, but go ahead and give that shout out for your LinkedIn download, because that is a generous offer. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, recently LinkedIn rolled out a new feature where you can put a, a web link at the top of your profile. My link goes to a free download of the digital copy of this book. So anybody that wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, it's just Andrew Olson, CFRE. Um, and there's a link to, to download the book. Awesome. 
Well, we're going to we're going to do that. I'm going to definitely take care of that when we're done here, because I think that's that's just amazing. You know, we've talked a lot about um, leadership over the course of all these episodes. And Jarrett and I are always interested in what people have to say with all your research and your time working in our sector and even podcasting. How does leading a nonprofit successfully look like? Yeah, you know, it's whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, right? Because at the end of the day, that's all just about our, our taxes. It's not doesn't have anything to do with success of an organization. So w- when I think about leadership, you know, really it comes down to um, what's the culture we're building, mm-hmm. and and how are we engaging and developing our people, right? Because you you can't be a leader if no one follows. So it ultimately comes all down to the people. And, and the people, you know, those who are, I, I would say the most effective leaders understand that the talent in your four walls, whether they're actual or virtual, um, is the most important resource you have. And everything emanates from making sure that they're well cared for and well developed and equipped to be successful, whether they're serving uh, people in need on the front lines of your cause or their administrative support or back end or fundraisers or whatever. Um, successful leadership all comes down to caring well for the people that that you serve as a leader um, and understanding that you serve you don't um, you don't oversee and you don't you know dictate to you you actually are serving those people now given that question or given that point of view do you think that that definition has changed a lot just given coming out of the pandemics i think that definition is amplified like crazy coming out of the pandemic. Um, and in fact, we, we see this in our employee retention data. We see this you know, both internally uh, for our organization, but also with our clients. The, the organizations that are leaning into and, and leading well from a people perspective and a culture perspective, those are the ones that are retaining their staff that even when someone comes calling and saying, I'm gonna pay you more, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. People are saying, yeah, that's all great. I want that. But I work for an amazing boss, right? Or I, I have an amazing team. And you can't, you know, no amount of money can fix a really bad culture, right? No, no number of perks solves for, you know, toxicity or a lack of clarity or, or so many roadblocks that you can't actually feel like you're being successful every day. So we, we definitely need to, to address compensation, particularly in our sector. Um, but at the same time, it's those other things that really drive value for employees. Yeah, that was my same question, Julia, is how has it changed? And, you know, we hear now of state interviews, but I'm curious, you know, in the, in the HR uh, component side, but I'm curious because servant leadership has always been a really big, you know, title for our sector. And you mentioned the word serving. So is that still like, you know, the principle of principles? Is that servant leadership mentality? I, I think in many cases it is, but I, I'm going to call a little bit of BS on this, right? I think okay. in our sector, we like to talk nicely, mm-hmm. yeah. but if you look at the way we actually treat people, oftentimes it doesn't align with the words that we use, right? Sure. So we, we say that we're all about making sure that, you know, um, that we're building communities and we're healthy, thriving communities, but we also say, eh, it's okay to pay a, a not a living, living wage because right. they're doing good work. Like that's crap. Right. If right. we can't deliver services and also take care of our people, then we probably ought to stop what we're doing and roll up our organization and say, we failed because we can't figure this out. You know, there, there's a lot of people who have a, a great passion for what they're doing, but if they don't understand that taking care of the people in the organization is paramount, you know, I, I ascribe to something that comes out of Harvard Business School called the service profit chain thinking. Right. And what that says, and, and it's proven out, is if, if your employees are well cared for and feel valued, they will care for your customers, in our case, the end recipients of our services, right. and in turn, your revenue and profit will grow. And if you look at the companies that follow this, whether they're commercial or nonprofit, the data tracks to that methodology. So you know, even if we purely say this is about the money and we follow that metric just to be profitable, it works. But the outcome is our people feel well cared for and they feel safe and they feel engaged. And that means the people that they care for are going to feel better about the work you do too. 
So if we're not living that, no amount of us talking about how great the sector is and how much we care for people and like at the, at the end of the day, unless we're living it, it's crap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you you calling that out. You know, we wave the flag for that equal pay as well, or just, you know, kind of right-sizing that compensation. Mm -hmm. um, but talk to us about how we can execute this effectively. So how do we put our words and our actions, you know, to 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 the test? Yeah, so whether it's about compensation or, or executing your annual strategy, whatever it might be, right? So when I think about effective execution, it's it's all about doing the things that actually deliver results, right? So I, I, I had a mentor once uh, who uh, was a, a fundraising consultant and she used to say to me, don't mistake activity for progress. There's a lot of yeah. stuff we do <clears throat> yes. in our day-to-day -day work that makes us feel like we're getting things done, but it's not actually moving the needle on the value we're saying we deliver in the community. So, so for me, this effective execution is all about us sitting alongside each other and really challenging one another to say, is what you're doing today actually moving the needle? And whether that's a, a major project or even a really small, like, hey, I had to make this phone call today. I, I feel like particularly for fundraisers, right? And, and I've, I've lived that life myself. So I, I feel like I can challenge us here. You know, I, I can't tell you how many major gift officers I talk to who say, oh, well, I, I got to look at this event spreadsheet and I've got to go talk to this person about, you know, what the setup's going to be in this room or this or that. And I'm like, no, get on the phone and make a call. That's what's going to move the needle for your organization. Not what color the doilies are at the next event, right? right. But it's, it's so difficult to actually focus on the things that deliver the most meaningful impact. And unless we hold ourselves accountable and we as leaders hold our teams accountable, uh, we're never going to get there. We're going to do a lot of work and we're going to have a lot of you know, wheel spinning and we're going to feel good at the end of the day and go, wow, I did so much today. And whatever our cause is, is going to be no further ahead tomorrow because of that. So I love that mentality. And, and my mother always used to say, it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. you, know, you spin your wheels, you do things that don't really save you in the long run. So what are some tips that we can as leaders help get out of the way, get ourselves out of the way? I mean, how do you, how do you effectively get that mandate out there? Yeah, uh, so I have so much to say. I know we only have like 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll be brief. I think the first one is as leaders, we have to get really comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. One of our biggest challenges as a sector is that because what we do in large part is caring for people, caring for animals, caring for the environment, we, we want to treat people well and we want to be liked. And sometimes we have to have conversations that are hurtful not, not that hurt people, but that hurt in the moment, right? Yeah. We have to have conversations that create tension and, and friction because that's how things get resolved. But we often shy away from them so that we can keep things happy and peaceful. And that is probably the biggest mistake and impediment to progress that we as leaders have in, in our entire sector, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think we need to be really intentional about who we hire, how we resource them, and I, I don't just mean salary there, but I mean things like, do you have an intentional onboarding plan and do you follow it? Do you have training, whether it's in-house training or outsourced training? Do you have a mentorship program? Do you have a way for an employee to raise their hand and go, I don't understand how to do this and I've never done it before and not feel like they're beaten up about it, right? Those are the kind of things that are gonna allow us to actually move forward and, and achieve progress in whatever our cause is, uh, way more than anything else that we do. Wow, I love it. I love it too. And, and I have seen this time and time again. And I do think that I've seen the shift over the last three years, Andrew, you know, truly in the workforce. Um, and so you're right. We we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And, and I think that's a good, 
for everyone in life, right? Like there's been a lot of really uncomfortable moments in the last three years. Let's be honest about that. (laughs) So, uh, so looking at that, so how might we shift if we've noticed or even been told that, you know, our leadership stinks or uh, the, the path that we're going sucks, right? Like, let's just throw it all out there. Like, how do we start to, to move the Titanic? Because that's, you know, one degree, one degree will will move a big ship. So how do we start to move that if we're seeing we're not going in the right direction? I I think at at the most basic, it's you just have to start, right? So you don't have to fix everything tomorrow. I think oftentimes as leaders, we think, well, if something's broken, I've got to solve it now, right? Mm -hmm. And and it might be something that that's a three-year process, but you can't just not start because that feels daunting, right? You've got to take that first step. Um, so I, I think, you know, just start, even if it's just chipping away at a little thing. I, you know, one of my favorite statements, my staff knows this, my 14 year old daughter parrots it back to me. When someone gives me feedback, my first response is tell me more about that, right? Hmm. To give them an opportunity to really get to what's the core issue. And, and then once I know what it is, how do I then pick it apart and say, okay, if this is what has to get resolved, where do I start? What's the first thing to do, right? And I think as, as leaders, uh, particularly when those things like training and development and coaching and, and mentoring aren't even probably happening for most CEOs, because most nonprofit boards aren't focused on it, you know, they're sitting there by themselves going, well, crap, I'm, I'm a failure. How do I fix this? And they get paralyzed by the enormity of that question, right? Whereas I think if we just take a step forward, what's one thing I could do tomorrow different than what I did today? And then tomorrow, what's one more thing, right? Um, But I also think that, you know, as leaders, again, because we want to be liked, because we, many times we feel like, hey, we've achieved something because we're in this C-level seat right now. um, we, We might not be willing to really take the feedback that some of our junior employees give us, right? And I, I gotta tell you the, the, most impactful piece of feedback I've had in a number of years came from one of the most junior employees on my staff. I was leading a team of about 50 people. We were in a major change initiative and she pulled uh, me and a colleague aside one day and said, I know you all think this is going great, but do you realize it sucks for the rest of us? And maybe a little less raw, raw and a little more like showing that you actually understand how bad it is today would be helpful. And I, I mean, that, that woman, I've moved companies twice. She's on my staff now um, because I, you know, when, it, when the opportunity came up, I was like, she's the most honest person I've ever worked with. Bring her over. She's willing to have hard conversations. But I'm grateful to her because she, she was the one willing to raise her hand in a room of way more, you know, long tenured seasoned employees and go, I know I'm the new kid, but you need to know this, right? So I think creating that space for people to really be honest with you and then having the sort of in, uh, internal fortitude to say, I've got this feedback now. It's not likely that it's BS. And even if it's not comfortable for me, I have to own it and figure out how to resolve it. Those are the kind of things that I think make, you know, turn good leaders into great leaders. So how did you take her feedback? Did you address that then with the entire group to say, you know, thank you. One of you spoke up. This is what I heard. We want to like, how did you move that needle forward? We did. I mean, first we thanked her, right? And we, sure. and we, you know, we appreciated the fact that she was, you know, she was candid about it. We, uh, my colleague and I went back for a couple of days, digested it and thought through like, how do we move from here to what the team actually needs? And then, yes, we came back to the entire group and said, we missed the mark. You know, we, we are, yes, there's a major change initiative. We are excited about where we're going. We believe fully in what the future vision is. We also acknowledge that, yeah, it probably does suck right now. And then we share with them, like, we're not sleeping. We've been, you know, I was on the East Coast. My colleague was on the West Coast. We would literally trade emails in the middle of the night when she was about to start working after, you know, a long day of work. And I was just finishing up after, you know, going to bed at two in the morning. So we started to explain, like, even though we have a positive approach to this and you can see us looking excited, it's just as stressful. It, there's just as much friction. It's just as uncomfortable for us, but it's also our job to make sure that we keep everybody engaged and pulling in the same direction. Given, given all of that, we understand that a recalibration is also important. So let's just be honest with, you, with each other about the good and the bad. 
great. What, what a great real life story. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And um, so how do we know when leadership is successful? I mean, hopefully that same colleague raises her hand and says, you're crushing it, Andrew. <laughs> like, How else do we know that? Yeah. Well, so I, I, I kind of joked about this early on in our conversation, but like, you're not a leader if nobody's following, right? Yeah. yeah. So I look at organizations that have serial turnover, and, and the first thing I think is, okay, there's a leadership problem there, right? It's not just because some other company came into the market and is doing amazing things and, and everyone wants to go work in tech or you know become lifestyle bloggers or whatever it is. There's a bad leader there that no one, and no one's addressing, right? Um, so I, I think followership is important and it's a key indicator. Uh, employee retention is a key indicator. Whether or not your staff is recruiting new talent for you is a key indicator, right? So one of the things that I love about our team is our people are regularly raising their hand saying, hey, I know somebody who could fit that role. Or, hey, you know, this is a person I worked with before. We want them in our company. That tells me that, that the team trusts where we are from a leadership perspective, right? That's I mean, a great were, point, Andrew. I would have never yeah. thought of that as a data uh -huh. point, but that yeah. that's a big aha yeah. moment for me. Yeah. And yeah. I think the other one is when your best people go silent, you know, you have a problem. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, we do this internally. I encourage other organizations to do it. We do an annual survey uh, of our employees and it's not just, you know, it, it's a, it's a real survey, right. And it gets down to a net promoter score where, and, and it's, you know, Sometimes it's painful, but it, it gives us all the data we need to go and address things. And, and the most important part is once you've done the survey, just like with donors, you then have to say, we heard you. That's Here's right. what we think the plan is to solve it. Do you agree? Right. And then you work through a, 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 a plan with them and a process to make sure that we're addressing the things that people brought up. And they might be you know small, mundane things, or they could be really big issues too. You know, I'm so curious, and I, and I wish we had more time, but we don't. I, I've got to ask you this question. Given all the changes that we've been going through because of, and we always say multiple pandemics, you know, everything from, you know, COVID to social injustice, the economy, political disruption, all this stuff. Yeah. Um, are you finding that you have employees or team members that want stronger leadership? or that want to be more independent? I mean, are you yes. making a difference? <laughs> yes, good. Um, here's, what, here's what people, uh, and this is a, it's a broad statement. I know it's not 100% true. What people <laughs> want is they want clarity of expectation. Mm -hmm. They want uh, uh, articulation of the guardrails. And what I mean by that is, what's my decision authority? Where, okay. where what's my path, right? Where can I go? They want to understand where they can be successful and what success looks like. Uh -huh. and, and then they want to be left alone to do the good work, right? But they also want to have a safety net. So when they don't know something or they make a mistake or they have an issue, they can fall back on, on a leader or a peer, but they also want to know that it's going to be in a way where they're not made to, to feel a fool, right? Uh -huh. So when, when we create that kind of structure, that's where people thrive. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I think it's always been that way. It is at a, a significantly amplified level today because of all those things. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, like it might not have changed, but it certainly is amplified. Yeah. So this brings us a lot of amazing tips. And I, I can imagine our viewers and listeners, Andrew, are thinking we have so much to do. So, so can you tell us like, you know, where do we start? Is there, I, I know we can download your book. I know there, you know, that there's uh, the podcast we can listen to. If we could, could take away one thing from today's conversation, what would you recommend that for our leaders? Uh, the one thing for leaders, invest in getting to know your people and getting to understand what's important to them, what makes them feel successful, and then go do that. Great. And, and I loved also, Julia, I don't know if you took this away, but you know, it could be a three-year journey, but chip away yeah. now and, yeah, and don't get overwhelmed with, this is going to take so long, you know, really start today. Yeah, I did hear that because I do, Andrew, I think we think, oh, a solution is a, a, 
you know, yes or no, A or B. But yep. we we tend to get frustrated when in, when it's not. And the reality is we have, you know, kind of a flow of things. And so I appreciate it very much that you kind of uh, helped us rediscover that because that's, a, well, that's an important thing. Yeah. And, you know, my, my good friend, Kat Landa, who, if you go to my podcast, she and I have done a couple of shows together. She talks about the idea that like, there's no more change process, right? Change just, uh, just happening constantly. Just change. <laughs> so, so we as leaders have yeah. to get really comfortable with the idea that tomorrow is going to be different than today. Right. And three days from now is going to be different than tomorrow. Right. And we just have to live in that discomfort and find a way to to get comfortable with the fact that iterative change is the reality. I love, I love that because that is so dang true. And you know, we we uh, understand that in the nonprofit sector, but we don't always articulate it that way. I really appreciate that. Hey, here's our Andrew Olson, CFRE's information president of Altus Marketing, altusmktg.com, or check him out on the Rainmaker Fundraising Podcast. Um, what a great mind, what a great way for us to uh, really delve into this next phase, which so many of our nonprofits are doing as we kind of gear up for the, the, the second half and the end half of the year for so many of us. So this has been really great. Also, we want to remind everybody that you have a book at, right after this episode. I'm going to go to LinkedIn and, and definitely download it myself. 101 Biggest Mistakes Nonprofits Make and how you can avoid them. Uh, check out Andrew Olson CFRE on LinkedIn and you can get access to this. Amazing, I'm really energized, Andrew. Super excited that you would join us. Again, if we hadn't met before, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by my intrepid co-host, Jarrett Ransom, who's held down the fort for a full week. Thank you, thank you, Jarrett. <laughs> Happy um, to do so, absolutely. Well, and I must- welcome back. Thank you, I must report that um kevin pace our executive producer was like wow julia jared was great and it was just fabulous we didn't miss you <laughs> that's not true <laughs> just saying so that's that's a good report hey also another good report for us are all of our sponsors who are here with us day in and day out bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit nerd fundraising academy at national university staffing boutique and nonprofit thought leader these are the folks that are with us day in and day out so that we can uh, give you our messages and and open the world through the nonprofit show it's been amazing andrew so exciting we have a lot more to talk about i think my friend thank you for having me i promise next time i come back i'll bring a goat Please do. Absolutely. Please do, because that would be, I, I would say, Jarrett, a first for us. We've never had, I mean, other than, you know, your domestic animals, a cat and a dog that show up, we've never had any other animals. So we would love a goat. We would. Let's do it. I, I would say, I would say we need a goat. We need a goat. Yes. We need a goat. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody. We like to end every episode and we want to remind you as well as ourselves to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.